As I was studying my Bible, I noticed in uh, Matthew, this, this, this is a pretty old Bible, but down at the bottom of the page, it has a lot of references. And a lot of the references came from Isaiah. So what do you do? You go back to Isaiah and you start looking at these scriptures and thinking about Christmas and uh, all the lights uh, on TV, the songs that they sang on the radio, uh, everything's going on about Christmas, and then Santa Claus. You know, and as I read this, I thought about America today. You know, uh, why aren't the churches full of people on Christmas, or before Christmas, or after Christmas? And Isaiah, and, it's, and it says this. He says, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Understand with their heart and turn and be healed. Boy, that sounds like what our country, our nation needs today. He goes on over here and he says... Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel. And that's a song that Kathy just sang. Emmanuel means God with us. And we as Christians today, we know that Jesus came down here upon this earth, lived a sinless life, yet he was willing to go to the cross we bled and suffered and died for our sins. This morning we just come around the Lord's table again to remember his death, burial, and resurrection. And Paul instructs us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Think about Jesus this Christmas, and maybe we can spread the word too, because that's what Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. And I think that's what Jesus has done for each one of us. He's sending us out into the world too. We're, we're his disciples. If Jesus Christ is not Lord of all, is he Lord at all? Would you pray with me? Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that you knew us. You knew how forgetful people, or especially I am. You instituted the Lord's Supper. Father, you... The bread which represents Jesus' body, the cup which represents his shed blood. For we know that without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness of sin. Father, we just ask, thank you for your grace and for your mercy and for the forgiveness of sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
morning. I want to reiterate uh, something I said last week, and uh, we sent out a text this morning that you probably got. And if not, um, if you're not on the text chain for the prayer chain, I'll just tell you now. Um, today that we're uh, talking about is a little more sensitive in nature. And so if you have a young one with you, um, like toddler or early grade school, uh, we have children's stuff available for them. Um, if they've already gone, then that's great. Um, if you are older than that, it is my opinion that they probably have already heard about a lot of this stuff anyway, so why not hear a Christian viewpoint of it? And so I feel like if you're in late grade school, junior high, high school, um, it's completely appropriate for you to be in here. But ultimately, as the parent, it is your decision. And so we're going to talk a little bit of uh, politics today, and we're going to talk a little bit of gender and sexual identity today. And so, uh, as you know, we've been going through this Q&A series where people ask questions and I give the best answer I can. And so if it's in the Bible, I'll say that it's found directly in Scripture. This is what the Bible says. If it's not directly in Scripture, then what I will do is I will uh, do my best to give a Christian worldview answer uh, based on my opinion, but know that my opinion is being formed by what Scripture says and what I feel led by God uh, to say. And so... uh, uh, that being said, uh, know that uh, we will start with the uh, politics and end with the identity issues. Uh, I pray or I hope that you'll uh, stay through the end. And if anything makes you upset, hear me out completely. And then if you want to talk about it at the end, I'll be more than happy to talk to you about anything you want to talk about. Um, and uh, I, I hope that you'll, you'll keep, keep through and listen uh, all the way through the end. I have said that I kind of uh, put these two together because I figured if people are going to get upset with me, might as well just do one week of people upset with me rather than multiple weeks. And so I kind of said, like, I can handle one stressful week opposed to, like, multiple stressful weeks in a row. And so these two don't necessarily go together, except for when I started putting them together, I realized that I was giving a Christian view on some hot topics with both of them. And so in some ways, they kind of fit together in that way, some things that are definitely weighing on our nation as we speak. Well, since it is such a weighty topic, I want to begin today with prayer. And so will you please bow your heads with me? Dear Father, I pray that you give me the words to say. And I pray that your spirit moves and that you help us to uh, listen and open up our hearts and just look for your guidance and your will in these issues, Lord. I pray this in your son's name. Amen. Well, I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, to the questions. The first question I have is how should Christians think about socialism? And is Acts 2, 44 through 47 socialism? Well, before we get into anything, I think we should define what socialism is. And now I'm not trying to get into a political debate on what socialism is here. I'm just giving you the textbook definition of what socialism is. And then you can decide in your own mind if that you think that fits the bill or not. Uh, but I'm just going to give you the textbook definition of socialism. A political or economic system which advocates that the means of production, distribution, and exchange should be owned and regulated by the community as a whole. Now, that is the textbook definition of socialism. Now, again, I'm not trying to debate every little uh, minute detail of that on exactly how it means, and I don't intend to debate every minute detail of what exactly that could mean. However, I first want to look, since the second part of the question is, is Acts 2, 44 through 47 socialism? I want to look now at Acts 2 and see what that verse says so we can see if this fits the bill. So in Acts 2, 44 through 47, now I want to kind of give you some insight here. This is the very beginning of the church. This is day of Pentecost. Peter has preached the first church sermon And in it, just before this, in Acts 2.38, the people are so cut to the heart uh, that Peter has one of the most successful invitations that anyone's ever had. And in fact, he doesn't even have to offer an invitation because people are coming up to him afterwards saying, what can we do, Peter? What can we do to be saved? And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it says that 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000. And then it says that they devoted themselves to certain things, you know, to prayer and the breaking of bread, communion, um, to fellowship, 
and to the apostles' teaching, which we have right here. And it's what we've kind of based our church service off of, is that, those words. And then after that, it goes into this in verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food and were glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Now, the question is, is this socialism? And just from a looking at just not knowing anything, just looking at them like, okay, well, they shared their stuff and everything was kind of owned by the community. I can see where you're coming from here, but there's a couple of distinctions I want to make. The first distinction is that this was not politics. This was not a government. This was a community of believers, like-minded believers, a body of Christ that had everything in common because everything was based around God. So this was not politics. And so whenever they, uh, they did this, it wasn't because of some political entity had told them to. The church and Christianity is not part of any political party, government, or nation. The church and Christianity, in fact, is beyond all of these things. They are capable of being in any of these things. And they are capable of being in any and all governments. However, they are not a government authority. Yes, the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was a government. The nation of Israel had a distinction of being an actual nation, but God set in the New Testament things to be different. He wanted all nations and tribes and peoples to be a part of it. And so he wanted his church to be spread out through all nations, not just one nation. In fact, I think one of the problems that the church had in the Middle Ages is it became too national. And so what happened was the kings viewed themselves as actually ordained by God and that they were actually the voice of God. And that became a problem because it meant that in order to uh, truly follow God, you had to do some reprehensible things in the people's minds because they associated their Christianity with their nationality. And those things, while can somewhat coincide with each other, they should not be identical to one another. Your Christianity should always be above your nationality. Your faith should always be above what country you were born in or a part of. And they are distinct in that way. Now, like I said, you can be a part of and within and participating in any form of those governments that we honestly see, unless that government is just completely and utterly hostile to Christianity. And I want to be clear, I mean completely and utterly hostile to Christianity. Not just some within the government are anti-Christian. And we'll get to that a little bit later. I also want to note that this was not mandated by any person or group with authority over the others. The apostles were not telling the people to do this. It does not say that in Scripture. It does not say that they commanded the people to give everything they had. In fact, a little later on in uh, Acts 5, we see this, uh, the story of Ananias and Sapphira where they uh, were struck dead because they lied about what they gave. The problem was not that they did not give all. The problem was that they lied about how much they gave. And sometimes we get confused that somehow it was connected to the fact that they didn't give enough. It, that wasn't the issue. They could have easily sold and given a, a quarter, a third, or a half of what they, uh, what they received from that, and that would have been just fine. But the fact that they went and lied about it to the Holy Spirit, that was the problem. And in the early church, God couldn't let that kind of uh, immorality rampant in the church because the church was so young, and so he actually struck them dead. Now, that's not, luckily for us, how he still operates today. Anytime someone lies about something, we're struck dead. That's not how it works. But in the early part of the church, that is how it worked because he wanted to protect the early church. He wanted to keep it as pure as possible until it was able to grow and establish itself better. And so these people, they sold and gave freely. They were not forced or mandated to do so. 
And so there is a difference. So is it socialism? Socialism? I'm not commenting on whether or not you, you feel socialism is right or wrong. That's not what I'm saying here. But the fact of the matter is that the early church in Acts 2 was not socialism for the reasons that I have put forth. Now, privately, you can decide however you feel about socialism. And as a Christian, you should decide how your faith meshes with any political party or governing style and then vote according to your conscience, whatever your conscience is telling you to do. But you should do that as a, your conscience with the stipulation that you're ba- basing it off of your faith because your faith should be the number one priority in your life. Personally, it's my personal opinion here, I do not believe any current political party in America or ideals that America has perfectly mesh with my faith. I do not believe any of them completely mesh. And so when I vote, I have to vote on conscience on what I think is right, and you should do so if you feel consciously able to do so. And this is my personal opinion, that none of the parties completely mesh. And it's also my personal opinion that I believe that you can be a Christian and vote for all the major parties. Now, I realize this is my, the thing that might start making people upset here, okay? So just bear with me here. I have met Christians that were Democrats. And I have met Christians that were Republicans and fully believed in their faith that they were doing the right thing by voting for that party. I have met Christians that were Republicans that because of some moral issues with um, abortion and things like that, they thought, I have to vote for this party. And I understand that. I get that. And I've also met Christians that have said, you know, I never heard Jesus really talk about abortions, but he talked about taking care of the poor a lot. And so they voted Democrat with a clear conscience because of that. And I understand that. And they did so with a clear conscience because they wanted to do what was right by God. And so sometimes by saying that in order to be a Christian, you have to vote one party, I think we're a little short-sighted. I think that we only view things from our context or how we believe. But if we look at a whole, we got to realize that no one party has the stamp of approval by God. Whether it be socialism, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Green Party, Independent, whatever you want to vote, consider yourself as and vote as, that is okay as long as you can make it mesh with your faith. I'm not telling you what to do here. I'm very careful about that whenever I preach that I don't tell anyone how to vote politically. Because ultimately, I don't think that's my job. My job is to teach you and tell you what the Bible says. And I don't see anywhere in Scripture that it says, thus saith the Lord, you must vote like this. And so you have to make your own peace and pray about it and decide within your own heart how you should vote. What I do know, and this right here is not opinion, is as far as a Christian is concerned, whatever type of government or political party that you are in, the church and Christian should always act the same way. doesn't matter what is the ruling party of the day, you act accordingly the same way as Christians. And the first thing that you do is you pray for your leaders. You pray for your leaders. 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy, Paul has these words to say. Now, you got to remember there weren't presidents back then. So wherever it says kings and people of authority, just sub-presidents and uh, senators and House of Representatives and stuff like that. And so 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 2 says, First all, then, I urge the supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified, in every way. I got to tell you, one of the things that frustrates me the most, and I have friends that are on both sides of political lines, and they both frustrate me so much on Facebook, especially during political season. Because when I see this, pray for all people, for kings and all who are made, and all who are in high position, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life Godly and dignified in every way. And I got to tell you, 
Facebook is not peaceful and quiet and godly and dignified often in the things that we put on there. You'll notice that I don't put political stuff on my Facebook. I'll put Christian stuff. Part of the reason is because I know that it starts arguments and it quickly turns into ungodly and undignified talk amongst Christians. And that's not a good example. It's not what the Bible says we should do. In fact, what it says we should do is pray for our leaders. By all means, pray that they will do what God wants them to do. By all means, pray that they will come to know Jesus Christ because we should pray that all people should come to know Jesus Christ. I don't care who they are. But pray for them so that we may live peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified. The next thing that we should do, according to any government you live in, is pay taxes. We should pay taxes. There are two verses I want to point out here. One is by Jesus himself. And in Matthew chapter 22, verses 17 through 21, it says this. Uh, these are religious leaders talking to him, and they say, Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the thing that are God's. So what should we do as Christians? Pay taxes. Give. We, the money that we have comes from the United States government. Give back what you are supposed to give back, but also make sure that you are giving to God what belongs to Him. And the Bible tells us that we should give an offering because everything truly belongs to Him. And so we give an offering back, and so we should also give taxes back. Now, that's not the only spot that this is talked about. In fact, in Romans, Romans chapter 13, Paul really talks about uh, all sorts of things with government related. But I'm going to specifically point out verses 5 and 6. So chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 say, Therefore, one must be in subjection, and he's talking about to the government. One must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. The third thing that we have to do as Christians is follow the laws of the land. We have to follow the laws. Now, I'll give a slight caveat here. If the law specifically makes you or is trying to make you do something that you know you cannot do consciously, like you directly, not necessarily through your taxes, this is not what I'm saying, but the directly is telling you that you have to do this personally. Like if they told me as a preacher I had to do certain things, then I am allowed because of my faith, to break that law. In fact, you see this in early Acts whenever the religious leaders who are controlled and kind of govern the area of Israel actually try to tell uh, Peter and John to stop telling people about Jesus. And their response was, no, we're going to keep on telling people about Jesus. And so in some ways they were insubordinate to the law of the land. Paul knows that, but he also has this to say. In chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. You are called to follow the laws of land and what the government has set forth. And let me give you a little backstory here so you understand all of Romans 13. In 13, 5, and 6, when he says you have to pay taxes and be subject because God has put those people in authority. And in Romans 1 and 2, he says the governing authorities were put there by God. You have to understand who was the governing authority of the day. That person was the second biggest persecutor of Christians in the Roman Empire had ever had, in Nero. In fact, I've said this before, but I'll say it again because it just gives you a picture of what Nero was about. He hated Christians so much, he used to dip them alive in tar and light them on fire to light his garden parties. 
And Paul is saying, follow what the government tells you to do and pay your taxes. I don't see the U.S. government anytime soon dipping us in tar and lighting on his fire to light their garden parties. Yet we tend to not want to do what our government's telling us to do. And we somehow think that, that we are allowed to do that because of faith. I see something different here. It doesn't matter how you feel about the party that's in control. You pray for them. You pay taxes. You follow the laws of the land. And above all, you remember this, that God is sovereign over any government. He has put that government in control and he can take that control away from them at any time because he is God. And whether America stands for another 500 years or falls tomorrow, it does not affect my faith in any way because God is in control. Now, I like my freedom here and I hope America does not fall tomorrow. However, I will be okay because I have God. And that's why whenever I preach about hope, I always talk about how hope should be in God and God alone, never about any election or what politics are happening in our country. Because ultimately, this is just temporary, earthly stuff. And eventually, no matter what, it's all going to fade away, and then we will only have one thing to answer for. And that is how we lived our life, how we told people about Jesus, and did we live away in a godly way. And then we have to answer to God and God alone because he is sovereign. And so those are the things I know for Christians. We have to pray for our leaders, pay taxes, follow the laws of the land, and above all else, remember that God is sovereign over government. Hopefully, that answers the question of how should a Christian view socialism. I know I didn't really talk a lot about socialism, and I kind of you might think I skirted the issue, but ultimately my opinion is How should a Christian feel about socialism? How should a Christian feel about any political party or government? And ultimately what a Christian should do is look in their own conscience, live a Christian life, and do do those four things that I said. And if we've done that, then that should tell you how a Christian should think about socialism. Second question that was offered to us today is, how should a Christian view transgender uh, slash queer people, and how should they be treated? Now, again, I ask you to hear me out all the way through the end. Don't just jump to conclusions on what I might or might not say. The first thing, I want to, again, define some terms, because unfortunately, we so many terms get thrown around sometimes, we don't completely understand what everything means. And so I want to define some terms here. And so transgender is a person whose sense of personal identity and gender does not correspond with their birth sex. Now, we're not necessarily talking about cross-dressing here. We're not necessarily talking about homosexual here. We're talking about someone who does not feel their identity is what they were born as. As far as queer... A person whose sexual or gender identity does not correspond to the established ideas of sexuality and gender, especially heterosexual norms, is what they consider queer. In many ways, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, they all identify themselves in one way or another as queer. Queer is kind of the overarching now term that is used for that. In fact, you often hear the LGBTQ as kind of a uh, abbreviation of this group. And ultimately, any of them, and maybe they, they don't identify as queer, but any of them can technically be identified as that if they so choose, according to our culture. Now, I want to give God's view on gender and sexual identity. And the first thing is that God made us male and female. Now again, stay with me through the end here. So if at first I sound judgmental or something like that, I want you to hang with me here. God's view is that God made us male and female. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
And you might say, well, that was before the fall, Nathan. That was before the fall and before sin changed things. Well, if we turn over to chapter 5, if we turn over to chapter 5, we see that this is after fall, and yet God is still using Moses to write down words that he wants to remind people after the fall. And so in chapter 5, verse 2, he says this, Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man, and that's the capital man, meaning all mankind. Named them man when they were created. You see, God intended, and the purpose of God was that there would be male and female. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, um, it deals with a lot of things, and I don't 100 know if I feel that this is correct or not, but I want to present it as a possibility for this interpretation. It's talking about head coverings and uh, the length of your hair. And I think there's other ways it can be interpreted, but someone presented this to me, and I did a little research, and um, I, I can see where they're coming from, and I don't 100% know where I land yet, so I want to make that completely clear. But I want to present this to you that, uh, yes, the main uh, parts of chapter 11 are dealing with the authority within the church and the home, but it might also deal a little bit with following the gender norms. And so whenever they're talking about how um, a man should have short hair and his head should not be covered, and then a woman should have long hair and it should be covered, they could be referring a little bit to the gender norms, following the gender norms, so that way when people see you, they know instantly, are you male or female? Are you following the gender norms of the day? Now, it's a cultural thing. If you're a female and have shorter hair in here today, don't think that we are uh, judging you for that, because the cultural norm of that today is different than it was uh, almost 2,000 years ago. However, there is still gender norms. In fact, the definition of queer was people that, especially heterosexual norms, people that didn't follow those norms. So there still are norms of what is female and feminine and masculine. And that's okay. Sometimes we get caught up in this movement of um, we think equality has to mean that we are exactly the same across the board, but that's not truly what equality should be. Equality means, yes, we are equal, we are made equal, and we should have equal rights, but we have to accept the fact that we were made also different. And you can be equal and different. And this means you have different physically and often in roles. And that doesn't make you lesser or more. We are equal. And that's how God made us to be. In fact, God calls that Adam and Eve were helpmates with each other, is the word that is used. Yes, Adam was given a place of spiritual authority, but not because he was better or that uh, Eve wasn't his equal, but just because that's the way someone had to be in authority, and that's the way that God ordained it to be. Now, we don't have to understand the complete reasons, always. Sometimes we just have to, if we have faith, trust in God that he knows what he's doing. We don't have to understand the ins and outs of every little thing. We just have to know that we trust him. And so we do that. And so we are made equal, but different. And so that is important to remember when we're talking about identity. Also, it's important to remember that sex is for procreation and recreation. And so if we're talking about gender and sexual identity, it has a dual purpose. Now I know not everyone can use it for procreation because of a multitude of reasons. Maybe you can't have kids or you know something like that, and I understand that. And you're not judged for that. However, the design of sex in a perfect world was both for procreation and recreation. And so therefore, in a relationship or uh, whenever you're uh, using it in life, it should be seen as such. Now, I want to be clear that there are many sexual sins involving both heterosexuality and homosexuality. And they're all sin. We have a tendency to judge one more harshly than the other, and that should not be the so. It should not be the way it is. Sexual sin is sexual sin. And we can't look down on one group and then think it's perfectly natural that someone gets to know each other before marriage. 
They're both sin. Now, the good news is all sin is forgivable. And so it doesn't matter what you've done in your past, you can be forgiven. But I do want to read how all sin that's in sexual in nature is seed in the same. And so we have Romans chapter 1, verse 26 through 27. And it says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing sameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Obviously, that is God is saying through Paul that what is happening there is not the way God wants it to be. However, when we flip over to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, it says, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be named among you, as is proper among saints. So within the church, within Christian people, any form of sexual morality should not be named among you, meaning it should not be present in any way. Which one's worse? They're the same. Why are we making distinctions? Why are we trying to say that one is worse than the other and look down upon one more so than we do the other? We shouldn't. The fact of the matter is, everyone who does not know Jesus needs to know Jesus. Because everyone that doesn't know Jesus is in sin. But once you know Jesus and you commit your life to him, you're now not in sin. Yes, you will still make mistakes, but you have forgiveness. And so therefore, you follow after God and you do what God wants you to do, not based on some law or legal structure, but because you want to, because you love him more than anything else. And so you follow after him no matter what it could mean for yourself. The problem is, the view I just mentioned and the view I think you should have, that is when your identity is wrapped around and completely seen through the lens of your faith. The problem is that the issue of uh, gender and sexuality has a different way of viewing identity. And they view their identity not through their faith, but through their gender and sexual identity. And it's not just them. People that are heavily into politics, like I mentioned earlier, tend to view their politics as the lens they view everything else through. Sometimes it's uh, your family situation. You always see yourself as a daughter or a son, or sometimes you only see yourself as a husband or a wife, or sometimes it's your job. Sometimes you're like, well, I'm a teacher, so I am a teacher, so I view all things through that lens of being a teacher. But unless your number one thing the thing that you're viewing everything else through is your faith in Christianity, then you have your identity wrong. And so what happens is when you're viewing everything through a different identity, it changes the way you see the world. And you no longer see how you should be living, but you see how maybe unfair things are around you. You see how you don't like the way that things are and you start to reinterpret Scripture to fit what you want because ultimately Scripture isn't your authority. Your identity, your gender or sexual or political or whatever identity is now your governing authority of your life. And so therefore you now view everything through the lens of it. And so you take this word and it's no longer God's word, but it's just nice words that you help to fit what you want it to say. And we all can have a tendency to do that but it's the fight we have to make daily to make sure that this is how we view everything else. So I've had many people come and tell me, I believe the scripture is saying this because of this experience I had. And I immediately think to myself, I don't always say it because it's not always an opportune time to say, you got that backwards. You should have looked at the Bible and say, I immediately think of this of my experience because of what I read in the Bible. The Bible is our ultimate authority. And that might mean some drastic changes in your life, or even some of your rights have to be taken away, or even that you have to give up areas of your own life in order to live more according to Scripture. 
In fact, that's what God calls us to do. You know, we had this sermon before about how we talked about how God is asking us to give up stuff. The rich young ruler, he told to give up all of his possessions. Why do all of us have to give up all our possessions? No, because that was the lens that he saw everything else through. He told the person who wanted to go bury the loved one, let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. Why? Because his connection to that loved one was the lens that he viewed everything else. Over and over again, God says, you have to sacrifice things in order to follow me. It won't always seem fair. It won't always seem like you're getting what you want. But the end reward is worth it. Because without Jesus and without following Jesus, then we have no hope. And we only have hope if we follow Jesus with everything that we are. And as Christians, we need to view things as such. But that also means that we need to view people the way that God views people. And that means when we answer this second part, how should they be treated? It becomes very clear all people, including transgender, queer, homosexual, or anything else, should be treated with love, kindness, and compassion. Nowhere in Scripture does it tell us that we need to judge someone that is doing something wrong outside of the church. I'll get back to the inside of the church here in a moment. But outside the church, those that are doing things wrong, we don't need to judge them because they don't know Jesus. And so therefore, their internal destination is already set because they don't know Jesus. Our job as Christians is to tell them about Jesus. And to do that, we have to do love and compassion and kindness. Not standing on a street corner with a sign that tells them they're going to hell. Not picketing a funeral. Not spouting things on Facebook that seem like they're... uh, judging others for not believing exactly what you believe. If they don't know Jesus, then it doesn't matter what they believe. It doesn't matter how they live their life until they know Jesus. It is not our job to be the moral police of the world. It is our job to live according to Jesus and to tell people about him. And then let the Holy Spirit do that job. He's the one who convicts. Now, within the church, we are called to judge. And by that, I more specifically mean we are called to point out sin when sin is in the church. Because we are Christians, we should all be following Jesus and Christ to to the best of our ability and see everything through the lens of that. And so if there's sexual immorality, as we see in 1 Corinthians where Paul says to actually kick someone out of the church because they're sleeping with their father's wife, then that's what we're called to do. Now we know from 2 Corinthians that it seems like through love and kindness that they actually brought that person back in and he's actually telling them to not treat them poorly because they were once kicked out of the church, but to treat them with love and kindness and forgive them. And so that's the goal, is to get people back in the church, not to kick them out and leave them out forever, but it is to kick them out so one day they can be saved. And it also means, uh, according to Jesus, where he says in Matthew 18, that if someone sins against you or does a sin within the church that you know of, you approach them personally and talk to them. If that doesn't work, you get another person to go with you and you go talk to them. And if that doesn't work, you continue to do so until eventually you might have to kick them out of the church as a leadership who will decide that. Always with the goal that they will be brought back in through love and kindness and compassion, so that way they can live according to Jesus. And so, how should a Christian view transgender, queer people? It's not the way God designed it to be, but that doesn't mean that we treat them poorly. We shouldn't view it as the ultimate sin, because it's not the ultimate sin. There's lots of sins out there, and God sees them as the same. How should we treat them, we should treat them with love and kindness and compassion. Not with condemnation or hate or judgment. But we should go alongside them and show them how much we care for them as human beings because as human beings, they were created in the image of God. 
And the problem is they just don't see that as part of their identity yet. But they could. And so we come alongside them and love and care for them. Just like we should with all people. Like I said before, you may not agree with me on everything. And I told you when something was an opinion of mine and when something was directly in Scripture. If you have conversations about any of this or want to have a conversation, I, I would love to have that conversation with you. I don't turn those down or shy away from those. And so I, I am open at the front, or if I'm in the back at the end of the service, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about anything that we talked about today um, or in the coming weeks. Feel free to call me here at church or come by. Uh, I hope that as we leave here that we can live Christian lives, and that's my goal, and treat other people the same way that Christ has treated us, with love and kindness and forgiveness. Let us pray. Dear Father, we are grateful that you sent your Son to die on the cross for our sins, and that you gave us a way that we could escape judgment because of your love. I pray that we live accordingly, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, if you'll uh, please be seated, I got a few announcements to make, and then we also uh, have something that we have to take care of in house uh, church uh, stuff. But while I'm making those announcements, if those that I asked to uh, uh, pass some things out, if you would, if you are a member of the church, uh, will you just please raise your hand uh, if they don't know, so that way they kind of know to give who to give these to. We are voting on elders and deacons today, so while I do the announcements, you can kind of uh, do that, and uh, we'll pass those out. As you're leaving today, if you voted on one of those, will you please just drop them in one of the um, offering plates, either at the back or at the front, and you're welcome to just drop them in there, and then I will get them later, and we'll count this up and text out uh, if the people were approved to be an elder. I think it's actually a deacon and trustee. I don't think we have anyone up for elder. Um, know that through the process, uh, we got uh, nominations, and we always uh, talk and pray about those, and then we uh, uh, go to people and ask them if they are interested in it, and then we put forth the people that we have deemed meet the qualifications, and then also uh, have accepted uh, to do that. So if you're thinking, well, I nominated this person, why aren't they on there? Uh, it's, they could have not felt that they were ready or wanted to do that yet. And so uh, don't just think that we just left the name off without discussing or talking with those people about it. And so I just want to make that clear as well. Also, tonight is Christmas program practice from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Also, uh, since next Sunday is the Christmas program, uh, they're going to do an additional practice at Saturday from 9 to 11.30 a.m. And so if you have kids that are in the Christmas program, uh, uh, come tonight, come on Saturday. Also, along with that, uh, we are going to be decorating for the Christmas program Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. If you can make it there to help, I know Ashton um, could really use some help on uh, getting everything set up. So if you are able, there'll be jobs for any type of person. And so if you're able to come at 6 p.m. there, um, come, help us get this set up, and that way we can do that and get it ready. Also, uh, with the program being next Sunday, there will be no Sunday school. In fact, the program and everything might take a little longer than our normal service, uh, kind of like today, which I apologize for. Uh, I was long-winded today, a lot to cover. And, uh, and then, but there will be a potluck afterwards. Now, if you're concerned about the potluck, we understand you don't have to stay, but you're welcome to stay, and we put everything's paper products, so that way uh, you can just throw it away when you're done. And we also put Germex at the front of the um, food station so that way you can sanitize your hands before touching anything and uh, you can keep as distance as you would like on the tables. We'll put out plenty of tables, even more tables if we have to, to make sure everyone can have a seat and there will be food there available for you. Um, and then other than that, if you weren't able to give an offering today, uh, you can still give. Uh, you can either do so um, through online at the blue button at the bottom of all the pages on our webpage or through the Givelify app, you can give that way, or you can always mail a check-in. Um, and I say this partially for those that are watching at home because there's still a few people uh, that uh, are watching from home at this, and so that way they know they can continue to give if they feel led to do so. Uh, we aren't having a closing song because I knew we were going to go late today, and so I thank you uh, for coming today, and you are dismissed. Thank you.